Welcome to another edition of Education Matters. I'm Ray Penny. I'll be your host today. Today I have Mike Calvert with me. All Mike's right. the director of NJSBA's legal and policy services. And um, labor relations. And labor relations. I'm Let's sorry, I forget Mike. them. Uh, Mike, how long have you been with New Jersey School? I've been 24 years as of the end of March. All right. And it has never been dull. <laughs> Uh, what we're going to be t discussing today is the non-renewal and other personnel matters that you have in May. Why is May such an important month for these d discussions? Well, it, there really is at least three reasons for that. Number one, for all districts, whether your election's in April, your election's in, in November, or you're a, a type one district and you go to a board of school estimate, you have finished or you're in the process of finishing up your budgetary process. So budgets are in place for next year. You know what dollars you have, and you're going to make personnel decisions. So that's one part. The other part, probably more significant, is there is a statutory requirement, 18A-2710, that all non-tenured teaching staff members, that means certificated staff people, need to be told of their employment status for the upcoming year on or before May 15th. So we've got that date lurking out there. Now, it wasn't always May 15th. If you go back far enough, to 1992 when the elections, April elections were held on the first Tuesday of April. The term, the date was April 30th for not notifying non-tenures of their non-renewal status. You'll often see in some collective bargaining agreements or board policies or perhaps in individual employment contracts that April 30 day which is sort of a vestigial remainder from from that time. In 93 when they moved the election from the second Tuesday to the third Tuesday in April the date moved from April 30th to May 31st, which created a bit of a problem in the following year. They moved it back to May 15th. Okay, so we're at May 15th. And Let me add one other piece. Okay. Collective okay. bargaining agreements and or individual employment contracts is the third piece. You might have provisions within either of those or board policies that call for notification on or before a particular date. April 1's not uncommon. April 15's not uncommon. April 30's not uncommon. All right. Uh, a board only acts on the superintendent's recommendation in terms of personnel. Um, so in the case of a non-renewal, what are they, they're not really taking any action, are they? Uh, not at that point in time. And that's really a fairly recent phenomenon. It goes back to the enactment of 18A 27 4.1, sometimes called the Rotundo legislation, after a case called Rotundo versus Crawstaddy through East Rutherford. The way the non-tenured process works right now is the superintendent will advise the board of any employees, certificated or non-certificated, that they're being non-renewed. The board presumably has an opportunity to have a conversation with the superintendent, that it, this, but the superintendent's word, decision at that time is what, is what counts. The employee gets notified. Once the employee is notified by the non-renewal, and there's no vote at that time, there's, there's a, a good part about that that we'll talk about yeah. in a minute. Once the employee is notified of the non-renewal, they have 15 days within which to ask for statement of reasons under 18A 27 3.2. The board has 30 days to give them that statement of reasons, and then after that they can ask for an informal appearance before the board, sometimes called a Donaldson hearing, after a Donaldson versus North Wildwood case from 1974, a New Jersey Supreme Court case. I remember it well. I, I'm sure you do. I mean, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> uh, having said that, the informal appearance is just that. It's not a hearing, but the m person who comes to that program, uh, informal appearance, if, if they decide to exercise their rights, get to bring witnesses, get to be represented, they get to go attend okay, a whole informal appearance. The relatively or reasonably prudent board president will, and board will say, Thank you very much. We'll take that into consideration, and they'll make a determination as to whether to proceed with that or not. If I'm understanding the Donaldson hearing correctly, then, there is an opportunity, maybe the only time, that a board can act without a superintendent's recommendation if they overturn, I guess, the superintendent's decision it and is, decide to renew the person? It is, in fact, the only time a board can hire somebody or rehire somebody without the superintendent's recommendation or against the superintendent's non-recommendation. There's a state board decision from 1997 from August, Velasquez versus Brielle, which interpreted 18A 27 4.1 uh, to say, it, yes, because it says the opportunity of a hearing is to give the employee an opportunity to convince the board to offer reemployment, not the superintendent, but the board, 
They read that particular provision in the law to say it's the board's choice at that point in time. Now, that legislation that came after Rotundo versus Cross Cities Rutherford gave the superintendent a tremendous amount of authority, much more authority than he or she had previously in personnel areas in terms of appointment, transfer, or removal of any employee. Previously, there was a regulation under monitoring where the superintendent would recommend the appointment of certificated staff members, but only certificated staff members. The legislation that came out of the litigation that invalidated that reg gave much broader powers to the superintendent. Uh, now, I'm assuming we're at the same meeting. There are uh, staff members who will be recommended for to, to be renewed. Mm -hmm. There they, they just vote yes, if they, if they agree. Can they vote no? Well, they, they can vote either yes or no, but they have to have a rational basis for their decision. They can't just decide they're not going to approve of somebody that the superintendent has recommended because they, uh, they wear orange shirts to school. Mm -hmm or they, you know, they don't like some, there needs to be a rational basis. It can be evaluation based. It can be based on other information that they have from the community, but they need to be able to articulate that rational basis because keep in mind, there will need to be generated a statement of reasons should the employee request them. And if the superintendent has recommended renewal, chances are the superintendent's not going to prepare that statement of reasons. That would be probably done by members of the board in conjunction with perhaps the board attorney to put that together because the superintendent wants to rehire this person. Uh, it's a big decision either way, whether it's a Donaldson Absolutely. hearing, whether it's a, a renewal or non-renewal. Mm -hmm. What information can the board member have to make this decision and when can they get it? It's an excellent question, and it's one that at times creates some tension between administration and the board. The seminal case in this area is a case called Horner versus Kingsway Regional. It's a May 1st, 1990 commissioner decision that says essentially that board members are entitled to see that information that they need in order to make informed decisions as a board member. Since there's now a decision to be made, the hiring or rehiring of this individual, board members could see resumes, they could see past evaluations relevant to this hiring, and they gain that through the custodian of records, generally the superintendent. Sometimes there's some tension, not surprisingly, between administration and the board in terms of just how much information you can see and when you can see it. What many boards will do is they'll have that information available in closed session at the night of the board meeting so that you maintain some security of the records. People can see the records, they can review them at that time, and then use them appropriately to make a determination. I've seen some boards do, back in the old days before we were so electronically based, I've heard of boards that have sent home evalu copies of evaluations mm -hmm. in packets. Not a good practice, one that we certainly would discourage because it really creates problems in terms of the security of the records. And um, you wouldn't recommend that they do anything with technology, email, that would no, not at all. I mean, you, you have privacy interests that the employees have in their evaluation. You need to protect that privacy interest, and you really want to avoid the potential for liability should that information get to the public. All right, we're talking about uh, renewals and non-renewals. Sometimes you have to have a reduction in force mm -hmm. for budgetary reasons. Uh, briefly, tell us how that's a little bit different. Okay, it's it's an interesting concept in that reduction in force and non-renewals. People sometimes use those terms interchangeably, and it, they, they, are, they are really different things. I mean, my wife and daughter are both teachers. My son is going to become a teacher, and I will, we could hear them come home and talk about, yeah, you know, all the non-tenured teachers got RIF notices. And I would say, oh, they're going to eliminate all those jobs? No, they're not going to eliminate those jobs. They're just going to be non-renewed. Well, then it's not a RIF notice. And we would have this dance and discussion every year about the distinction between the two. If a district is eliminating a position, going from 10 elementary teachers to 8 elementary teachers, that's a reduction in force. That's a RIF. Interestingly, the process is not anywhere as detailed in statute and code as it is for non-renewals. A staff member who is uh, RIFed, 18A28-9 is the relevant statute, doesn't even require technically a superintendent recommendation. The board can make that determination to eliminate staff. Now, if the board doesn't consult with the superintendent about that determination, 
that decision will be rendered arbitrary and capricious. So they need to talk about it. There's nothing in statute or code that speaks to timelines or hearings or anything along those lines regarding reductions in force, all built into collective bargaining agreements, individual employment contracts, board policies. So those would be the areas that would control how you effectuate a RIF. And then we hear the term last in, first out, and that's usually what it applies. Because you'd have bumping rights back into the district based on seniority generally. Now, without getting too deep into the weeds on reductions in force, administrative code controls seniority for certified staff members. And there's a whole series of categories in which people gain seniority and tenure. For non-certificated employees, many of whom do not acquire tenure, their seniority bumping rights, their recall rights, it's their who stays, who goes, who gets called back, all a matter of negotiations, all part of your collective bargaining agreement, individual contracts, board policy, what have you, but not found in statute or code anywhere. You know, you were talking about the timelines before, and you also mentioned that most school districts now move their school board elections to November. It seems like the timeline would be a little difficult with an April election. How does it the timeline, I assume, is the same for everyone, and uh, it may does it work better maybe for those districts that moved? That's a great point. We know there's only 73 districts that had their elections in April. We know the vast number have moved them to November. Uh, with respect to the non-renewal process with the May 15th deadline, if an employee, for instance, isn't notified in a timely fashion on May 15th, they are deemed to have been offered reemployment for the upcoming year. What happens then is they can send a letter to the board saying, thank you very much for reemploying me, and they have to do that before June 1st. So that process is still in place regardless of when the election is. One of the other questions that had, would come up annually is, which board, the board before the April election, the board after the April election, which board has the authority to make these non-renewal rehire or reduction in force determinations. Typically, the board in place at the time the contract begins is the one that gets to make that call. So you would have, you know, in theory, the board in place in May making a determination about contracts that would start July 1. The challenging aspect was, it, was what happens when your notification dates by contract or otherwise are before that time. Let's say you have an April 1 notification date in contract. Well, you've got to abide by that date. Right. But that's the old board. That's not the new board. One of the nice things for boards that have moved their election to November is that the board in place in April, is the board in place in May, is the board in place in June. It's the same board. That issue of new board, old board, old board goes out the window because the election's been moved to November and the new board doesn't come in until January. And sometimes you're you're a brand new board member, your first board meeting, and there's a group of staff members there because you've, laid, you've done your RIF notices. And that, that issue you know, is no longer an issue for the board at that particular point in time. Um, what in this process is an open and what is in closed session? Great question. Uh, actions that the board takes, take regarding hiring, renewal, transfer, etc., takes place in public session. Now, when we talked about the informal appearance before the board, the rice notice, let me back up a step. When we talked about the superintendent advising the board mm -hmm. that he or she intends to non-renew folks, that discussion presumably will take place in closed session. I'm planning to re non-renew these people. They're the folks on my list. Presumably these folks would get rice notices because they would have the option. It's discussing their potential employment, could adversely affect them they could move that discussion to public. Now, I don't think we've said what a Rice notice uh, is. I was just about that. was going to be my next question when you were done. Named after a case called Rice versus Union County Regional, early Sunshine Law case, basically under eight, under 10 colon 4 dash 12 B8 of the Sunshine Law. When you're talking about someone in closed session, a person, matter of personnel, and it may adversely affect the employee, they have the ability to move that discussion into public and they need to get a notice advising that you're going to talk about it in closed session. They need to get that notice 48 hours in advance of the closed session. They can then move that discussion into public. The board gets a request to move it into public. They now have two choices. They move it into public or they don't hold the discussion. But if the employee requests a public discussion, you can no longer have that discussion in closed session. So in a sense, the employee holds the card 
as okay. to how that, what, where that discussion takes place. Okay, that brings us to an end for this Education Matters. I'd like to thank Mike Calvert. Thank for you, Ray. Thanks I for the opportunity. You, you got some good information on that. If you have any more questions or suggestions for this Education Matters, please contact me via email or penny at njsba.org. And thank you for watching.